Thanks for checking out this video. I hope it's encouraging to you. I hope it helps you grow in your relationship with the Lord. If you're in the Tulsa area, we would love to have you join us at Christian Chapel so that you could not only grow in your knowledge, but you could grow in your relationships in experiencing God together. If you live in another part of the world, I want to encourage you to take all you can from this resource, but also plug in to a community of believers where you live. God's created us not only to know about him, but to experience him together. And that's done best in the context of the local church. Hope this blesses you, hope you enjoy it, and I hope God speaks to you through it. It is good to see you here today. My name is Chris. I'm the pastor at Christian Chapel, and you are joining us in the middle of our summer message series where we're walking through 1 John, and you have picked a great day to join us in that series um, because we're honestly in, in a passage that is one of my favorites, and uh, depending on how the next 30 minutes or so go... Um, I will have done it justice, or I will just go home and pray that God will somehow uh, speak to you through this passage in the same way that he's done for me. So we're, we're walking through this letter of First John and talking about how um, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all, and this is his plan for us, this is his purpose for our lives. And in this passage that we're in this morning, 1 John 3, verses 1 through 10, John starts to talk to us about our identity as followers of Jesus. Um, and it's, it honestly is one of those that the, the truths in these 10 verses are so deep and so powerful that if, uh, you know, I, I plan on being at Christian Chapel for a very long time. Um, but if for some reason I found out tomorrow that today was my last Sunday, I would be thrilled that this was the last message I preached. Or if I had a buddy who called and said, pick one, this is the one I would preach. And it's, it's almost the point of sometimes you, you encounter a scripture that the truth is so profound and has such tremendous ability to transform that you almost in some ways will hesitate to preach from it because you know, like I've known all week long, I do not have the intellect or the vocabulary to express what John is describing to us. And yet, as I've read and studied this passage, I've become convinced that if the truth being laid out before us would become the reality of our lives, we would see a level of personal and corporate transformation like we have never known before. And so as as we walk into this passage this morning, my prayer for you just all week long has been, Lord, uh, speak to others as strongly as you have spoken to me through this about the importance of rooting our identity in Christ and in Christ alone. So if you you have a Bible, we're going to read this together. If not, it's going to be on the screens for you. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, John writes, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who breaks the law, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. 
Now, there's a, a couple things that, that we want to sort out before we really dive into the, the truth of what's being said here. First, you understand in your life the importance of the identity that you choose to embrace. Because the identity you embrace is the truth you're telling yourself every day about who you are, what you do, and why you matter. And so, so think back over your life of all the different identities you've embraced. You were somebody's son or somebody's daughter. And that identity shaped you in certain ways. There were things you did and things you did not do because you belonged to a certain family. Or maybe if, if mom or dad, if they weren't part of the picture, their absence shaped your identity. Right? You were, you remember being the kid on Father's Day that never celebrated. You remember being the kid on Mother's Day that always mourned. And those experiences shaped you. Right? As, as you got into school, you quickly began to understand there were different identities being assigned. Right? There was the, there were the popular kids, there were the smart kids, there were the athletes, there were the nice kids, there were the mean kids. As you got older, there were the, the, the druggies, there were the partiers, there were the national merit scholars. And in all of these realms, identities are being picked up, identities are being earned, identities are being given, and those new identities are now shaping the way that we see the world, the way we see others, and the way we see ourselves. As you progress through life, you've had all kinds of identities, right? You've been the husband, you've been the wife, you've been the mom, you've been the dad, you've been the student, you've been the the success, and you've been the failure. You've been the one that was proud of what you have built and accomplished, and you've been the one that's been terribly ashamed of the things that you have done. And each one of those identities shapes you. And so John's big point here, now if, if you remember, if you've been here with us through the summer, he's writing this letter because the church he has started has begun to experience his challenges, experience challenges about who Jesus is. And wrong beliefs about Jesus are leading them to wrong behaviors and actions. So John's response to that is not to come and tell them to straighten up and act right. His response is to tell them, this is who Jesus really is. Remember it and live in it. And so now when it comes to our identity as the children of God, he's doing the same thing for us. He does not start by saying, hey, all you Christians, you need to straighten up and live better. But he says, you need to know who you are. And the foundational identity of every follower of Christ is laid out for us in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. This is it. This is where all of your hope, all of your worth comes from. But, but even here, we've got to, to work to understand, right? Children of God, there is a, a sense in which all of humanity, we are all the sons and the daughters of God. We've all been created in his image. We've been created by him and for him. And yet, we have chosen to sin, we've chosen to willfully, joyfully reject his kingdom and try to build our own kingdom, and so that hasn't removed us from the realm of his creation, but we have removed ourselves through our sin from the the realm of his kingdom as it's expressed through Christ. And so when John tells us, you are called children of God, he's not talking so much about the creative activity of God in the way he creates all of humanity. He's talking more about the redemptive activity of God in Jesus Christ. He's saying, you were created as children, you abandoned your calling, you abandoned your identity, you picked up all of these false identities, you thought you could do it on your own, you thought you could build your own towers to heaven, establish your own kingdoms, and it has led to death and destruction. And in this space, God has lavished his love on us, and now called us again as the children of God. He's called us out. He set us apart. He has adopted us. He's reminded us, I made you, you rejected me, but I never stopped coming after you. And when you turned and saw me chasing you, I didn't tell you, you can now struggle and strive and maybe get a little bit back into my love, maybe live as one of my servants, but instead, I lavished my love on you and I welcomed you as my children. This is the foundational identity John wants you to understand. Before you were anything in life, you were created to be the son and the daughter of God. 
Now, John's going to go on in this passage, and he's going to talk pretty uh, directly about the way that the children of God live. And he's going to tell us that, hey, when you're a child of God, you, you do not keep on sinning. You don't treat others in wrong ways. Right? You, you don't, you don't, there are just certain things you don't do. And he says, if you do those things, you're not a child of God. And he actually gets very direct. He says, you are a child of the devil. Now, this, this passage, again, can be approached in, in one of two ways. So think of it, think of it like a, a flock of sheep, okay? You can, you can get sheep on a path in two different ways. The first way is a shepherd who the sheep know, and they know his voice, and they follow him. He has their best intentions in mind. He can call to the sheep, and they will follow him on the path that leads to life. The second way is the shepherd stays back at a distance, and he turns out the sheepdog. And the sheepdog does not leave, lead the sheep with loving kindness, but instead he leads them with fear and intimidation. And he circles around the flock and he barks and he growls and he nips at their heels until he gets them in the space that the shepherd wants them in. So when we read 1 John chapter 3 and he talks to us about the children of God and the children of the devil, depending on your church background, this might seem like one of those sheepdog moments. We're here it comes. We're about to get the, the heavy hand of the scriptures laid on us. We're going to be told we better straighten up. We better do the right things or we will be known as the children of Satan himself. This is not John's purpose. John does not write to threaten people, but he writes to promise them this is the life that Christ has created. So now live in it, walk in it, experience it. He's trying to help us understand that, that your identity is your primary concern in life. And if you will let the Holy Spirit convince you that you are the son, the daughter of God, you have been chosen by him, then your life is going to flow out of that. Now, where, where we get that wrong is we think we have to behave so that we can attain the identity, right? That if I do all the right things, then maybe one day I will get up here and I will be known as the son or the daughter or the child of God. But John, his, his whole point here is, no, 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 you have been called the children of God. And so you're not trying to live up and attain this identity, but instead you're trying to live out this identity. And, in, and, and the difference in those two approaches makes all the difference in the world. If you approach it as, I'm going to behave right so I can earn this, you're locking yourself into a miserable religious experience. If you approach it from, this is who Jesus has made me, this is who I am, now by the power of his Holy Spirit, I'm going to live it out, it's going to be freeing, and it's going to be one of the, the most incredible experiences, life-giving experiences of your life. Maybe it helps, this idea of identity, think in terms of marriage. So whether, whether you're married or not, you're probably familiar with the, the teachings from Scripture that um, a man and a woman come together and two people become one. Right? From, from Genesis through Jesus through Paul, we see this again and again. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And so the, the goal of marriage, and, and when Angie and I do pre-marriage counseling with uh, young couples who are getting married, we always tell them, the goal of your marriage is for two people to become one. Right? And it, it means you're going to share more than a last name, more than a home, more than an anniversary. It means God's plan through the power of his spirit is he is going to intertwine your souls and your lives in a way where you become one. Now, Angie and I, we're, we're 17 years into this process. I know many of you, you are a lot farther down the road than we are. And if you have a healthy and growing marriage, right, not that you haven't had your rough patches, not that it's perfect, but but you you're striving for oneness by the power of the Spirit, then you understand what John's trying to communicate to us about identity here. He, when he says you are children of God, that is not something you wear on the outside. It's not something you pick up and put on on a Sunday morning. It's not something that when you read a book or hear the right song or feel in the right mood that, yes, I'm a child of God. But he's saying this is something that, that works from the inside out, this is actually the, the foundational belief, the core belief of who you are as a person is I am a child of God. So for me, when Angie and I first got married, I started to make different decisions because I had picked up a new identity as a husband. I was now a married 
man. And as a married man, it changed the way I spent my time. It changed the way I spent my money. It changed some of the primary friendships I invested in. It changed the way that I thought about the future. And it, it changed the way I interacted with the opposite sex. It marked the end of some friendships because they were no longer uh, appropriate. And now I was in this new season of life as a married man. And so I had this new identity, and what I was doing was trying to live in it. But I was very conscious of it because it was so new. And and many of you, you've been there as well. But what I know now, 17 years in, is that there are a lot of things I do, but I don't even think about them anymore. So if you come and you ask me, hey, can you can you do this? Can you go there? Can you give that? Can you help with this? My most common response when people ask me for stuff that's going to require my time, my energy, my resources is let me talk to Angie, you know? And it's, uh, honestly, sometimes it's a cop-out, uh, but for the most part, it's not, right? It's not the, go, t- go talk to your mom. That's a complete cop-out. But this one is not on the same level as that. And, and same thing for her. If you ask her, her response is going to be, let me talk to Chris. Now, why do we do that? It's not because I feel like I have to have her permission or she has to have mine. It's not that we're trying to present some picture to the world of, oh, we're so connected and we're so wonderful and we never have any problems. But it's after 17 years, this is who I am. This is who she is. This is who we are. We are one couple. We are one unit. And there's virtually nothing I do that doesn't affect her and virtually nothing she does that doesn't affect me. And so what I am now dictates what I do. And this is the way the identity in Christ works. There will be times at the beginning when you first enter into your relationship with Christ that you are very aware of the choices you're making. And you're saying, I'm not doing that anymore because I am following Jesus. But the longer you live with him, the longer you walk by the power of the Spirit, the more you saturate your mind and your heart in the Scriptures. The more you're surrounded by a community of believers who are striving for the same things, living under the same grace. Eventually, this identity moves from the outside. It moves from something you're hyper aware of all the time. And it begins to envelop every relationship, every dream, every hope for the future, every hurt and every heartache. And my identity as a child of God is just who I am. And it's in that space that who we are starts to bring hope, it starts to bring healing, it starts to bring salvation to us, right? Our our security in Christ is the antidote for all of our insecurities. When we know who we are, then it's going to flow out into what we do, right? To, To maybe think of it this way, who we are changes what we do. Now, you know this is true in your life. Again, there are times you you started a new job and suddenly there were things that you didn't do anymore that you used to do because now you have this job, now you have this responsibility. You enter into a new relationship, your life changes. As a, a teenager, I remember my parents saying to me repeatedly, you are a Tao and we don't do that. And then they would fill in the blank with whatever ridiculous thing I had most recently done. Right? Or they would be more positive. You are a Tao and we do this. And as they would say those things, it, it honestly, even when I was being corrected, it did not feel like a burden was being laid on me. But instead it felt like my parents were trying to lift me up to say, this is who you are. This is who God's made you to be. He's put you in our family. So you're a Tao and we care for other people. You're a Tao. We don't speak that way. You're a Tao. We don't do those things with our money. You're a Tao. We are honest. Right? So many times as a teenager, I remember my dad telling me, you're a Tao. Your grandpa worked hard. I work hard. And you're going to work hard. And I would think, ah, do I have to? You know, but it was, it was, it was just, it was very clear. There was, there was no option. This is what we did. This is who we were. Right now, John, he's going to transition and start telling us, because you're a child of God, this is what you do. But we cannot lose sight of the fact that in in this little section we're looking at, our, our actions are flowing out of our identity. If you're a child of God, this is what you're doing. So he says in verse 6, No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. 
Now again, this is where, so this is where the hammer falls in some churches. Right? Stop sinning. What's wrong with you? Behave better. Do the right things. But John is not coming with a, a hammer or a big Bible to beat you over the head and try to get you to finally straighten up. What he's doing instead is delivering us. Now, you might read this as a threat, and if you read that as a threat, my encouragement to you is just to, to begin to pray about that and ask God, why, why does the idea of not sinning cause so much fear in my life? Right? Just And just trust the Spirit to lead you, guide you. He's going to lead you into freedom in that. But, but what you read here, there are all kinds of promises in Scripture we love, to, we love to read, we love to quote. We love the idea that God is for us, who can be against us, that he sees us, he's never going to forsake us, that, that the, the best is going to be ahead, that he knows the future. We love all those. We quote them. You probably have them on the wall in your kitchen. I would, I would guarantee almost every dime that I have that no one has this on the wall in their kitchen. Right? If you do, please send me a picture later because you are the most Christian person I know. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. It sounds so harsh. It sounds so direct. But I'm telling you, it's one of the greatest promises of Scripture. What do we long for? We long for a world without sin. What's the cause of all of our problems? What's the cause of all the angst in your relationships, the angst in our world, the, the discord in your heart? What is it? It's, it's sin. And John is, he's telling us, look, it, if you live in him, you're not going to keep living that way. And if you know him, you're not going to sin. It's one of the most life-giving promises of scripture. You don't have to live that way anymore. Not because of what you've done but because of what Christ has achieved for you. He has made a way for you to live free of the rule of your lusts and your passions and to have a heart that is fully surrendered. Think of that sin you just can't get over. What this is saying is God came through Jesus Christ to set you free from that. You are the son and the daughter of God that will no longer be your identification. Your sin no longer defines you. This is the great truth of the gospel. That Jesus breaks every sin. He tears it all away. And yet we hear it as a threat. And we think, well, goodness, if that's the case, then I really need to watch what I'm doing. And and it again just reveals our misunderstanding about how the gospel works. Because... John's telling us here, Paul tells us repeatedly, it works from the inside out. Right? That Jesus comes to transform our hearts, our souls, our relationship with God, and from that transformed soul, it will now flow out into the world around us. But we constantly want to say, God, fix my behaviors, and then let those finally get in and fix my heart. John is helping us understand that the the sins of the heart, or the, the sins of the hands flow from the heart. Right? The, the things that you do that you're just tired of doing, those things that you've promised God a dozen times, Lord, please help me stop, hundreds, thousands of times even, take this away, take this away, take this away. Help me to stop doing this. Help me to stop saying that. Help me to stop going there. Help me to stop treating people in this way. And most of our prayers are about, God, change my behaviors. And all we're really engaging in is a form of religious hand washing, where we are saying, God, come and just wash the dirt off my hands. And maybe if I can finally get my hands clean, then my heart will be clean as well. And what John's trying to help us understand is, look, as long as you're just going to engage in the external it, you're just going to have a rinse, lather, and repeat Christianity. Because the filth is coming from the inside. Right? The sin is, is coming from deep within. And so your solution is not to maintain your appearances. Your solution is begin to ask the Lord, transform my identity. Help me to see. Right? If your only concern in life is to change your behavior then you're going to become a slave to a a soul-sucking form of religion that's all about the do's and the don'ts. And it's never going to bring you lasting freedom. 
What John is promising is when you're assured of your identity, then the right things are going to follow. And we want the right things. But we want to be able to say that we achieved them, that we worked for them, so that we can feel a little bit better than everyone else. He says, no, 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 it flows out of the right heart. So then the, the concern for some of us, especially for the, you know, just kind of a super type A, big rule follower, very everything's black and white. The concern is, wait, wait, wait. But if you're saying it's all about identity and that the actions flow out of that, you're giving people freedom to just live however the heck they want. And they're going to abuse the grace of Christ. And, and John, for him, that, that, if you made that argument to him, his response would have been, you're crazy. You, can't, you cannot be sure and certain of your identity as a son of daughter of God, one who's been redeemed by Christ, and then decide, now I'm going to do whatever I want. His transformative power is so great. It changes your heart. It changes your mind. It changes your relationships. It's going to flow out. Right, The same way that you can't help that you have your daddy's ears or your mama's laugh. When you become a child of God, you can't help but live as a child, as a citizen of his kingdom. So those who, who know him don't keep on sinning. It's not a threat. It's a promise. This is the life you can have. It doesn't mean you'll be perfect. But it means if you sin, if you stumble, if you fall along the way, you will quickly, by the power of the Holy Spirit, understand this is not who I am and this is not who I will be. And so I will repent. I will receive forgiveness. I will live in my identity as a child of God. And then John finishes by painting a picture for us of this just kind of a cycle of reinforcement. In verse 9, he says, No one who is born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning, because they have been born of God. And he's he's creating for us this very strong and, and unbreakable connection between who we are and what we do. And again, it's, it's not, he's not coming to threaten us. He's coming to say, when you know your identity, your life is going to flow out of that. And the life Jesus offers is a life of freedom. It's a life of hope. It's a life of healing. It's a life of salvation. It's the life you long for because it's the life he created you to long for. And so when you recognize there's sin in your life, the response is, Lord, forgive me. And place me back on this path where I am certain of my identity. Right? Our sin is an identity issue before it's a behavior issue. This is, this is what he's teaching us. This is the, the central message of why Jesus came to transform you from the inside out. And as he does that, he helps us understand, now you don't have to keep on sinning, but instead, you can now engage in a new cycle. And in this new cycle, who you are as a child of God is going to flow into what you do. And and Logan, if you can throw that up for me. So think of it this way. Your being, who you are as a child of God, is what's going to transform your doing. The way you invest your time, your money, your energy, the way you act in your relationships, the way you speak, the way you think. And as you begin to be sure of your identity as a child of God and you begin to live in righteous ways by the power of the Holy Spirit, as you do the things God created you to do, it's going to further convince you of who you are. Right? And, and, but this works the other way as well. If you don't believe that you're a child of God, then you're not going to live in ways that are conducive to life. You're going to make destructive choices. You're going to have some difficult relationships. You're going to experience the the full ramifications of sin. And as you do those things, it's going to reinforce to you, this is just who I'm made to be. I can't tell you the number of conversations I've had over the years with people just in the depths of sin. And, And they're... Their explanation is so, so sad and reveals such a great deception that they bought into. We'll start talking, and, and typically the, the talks start with what you've done. 
right? Because that's what revealed what was inside. And, and as we're talking about their actions, and at some point, almost every conversation, it, there comes a, the idea of, this is just who I am. This is what I do. This is what my family does. My great-grandpa had a drinking problem. My grandpa had a drinking problem. My dad had a drinking problem. Now I have a drinking problem. My mom was divorced. My grandma was divorced. My great-grandma was divorced. And now I'm going to be divorced. My brother and sisters are a mess. And now I'm a mess. And they just, they, they bought into this cycle. And the solution in those moments is not to say, you better straighten up. You better stop doing those things. The solution is exactly what John is doing for us here. He's saying, that is not who you are. Stop believing the lies. You're not the addict. Stop believing the lies. You're not the bad spouse. You're not the bad parent. You're not the prodigal. You're not the black sheep. That is not who God has created you to be. You are not the one with the lust problem or the anger issue. You're not the greedy one and you're not the jealous one. You are a child of God. This is what you are. And from that new identity, new life will flow. But we, we've got to get off that cycle. We've got to get away from it and just begin to embrace the life that Jesus offers. Now, for some of us, it's, it's not the, the kind of down-in-the-mud identity that we struggle with. Ours is a more elevated view of ourselves. Ours is a view of, hey, my being is, God's pretty lucky that I'm here. You know, had a lot of success, done a lot of good things. If we were picking teams, he'd probably pick me first. You know, and so you have this idea. And, and on, like for me, if, if we're being honest, this is, this is my struggle. Right? My whole life, my worth has been associated with my performance. So as, a, as an athlete, if we won the game, I had a higher value. If we lost the game, I had a lower value. As a student, if my grades were good and the scholarships were coming in, I had a higher value. And if somebody else did better than me, I had a lower value. Right? And, and these temptations don't go away when you graduate school or finish that season of life because now they attack as a, as a pastor. If people come to the church, my value's higher. If they leave, my value's lower. If the sermon's good, it's higher. If the sermon's not good, it's lower. As a husband, if my wife's happy, it's higher. If she's not, it's lower. As a father, if my kids are succeeding, it's higher. If they're not, it's lower. As a friend, if people like me, if they value my opinion, it's higher. If it's not, it's lower. And I can easily get stuck in this false cycle of reinforcement where I think that all of my worth comes from what I do. And so John's message to us is the same regardless of which side we come at it. You might feel worthless, or you might feel incredibly worthy. And his response is, what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. Before you were anything, a success or a failure. Before you were a slave to sin or free from sin. Before you were the, the one people looked up to or the one people looked down on. Before you were anything to anyone. Before your parents had named you or known you. You were created to be a child of God. And from that sure and certain identity, life will flow. It's from that space that your marriage will be healed. It's from that space that your future will be secure. It's from that space that you will be the parent God is calling you to be. It's from that space you will be the young adult he's calling you to be. It's from that space that retirement will be all that God wants it to be. From the sure and certain identity that no matter what happens, no matter what may come, no matter if it's good or bad or in between, I am a child of God. And when we plant our feet on that rock, God secures our identity. He's the one who reminds us. He's the one who leads us. 
He's the one who's answered every insecurity to every addiction, to every failure and the source of every success. And you can live at peace. You can get off this, that, that fall cycle in whatever extreme you find yourself on and you can live with the certainty that I'm a child of God. Because of that, sin no longer has dominion in my life. It may come, but it will be quickly forgiven, and I will move on on the path he has called me to. If you'll bow your heads and close your eyes, I want to pray for us this morning. Jesus, you see how desperately we need to know this truth. Lord, you see even now those who struggle to believe that they could be called a child of God. Because they think they're too sinful or because they think they're too successful. Either way, Lord, I pray that your spirit would come in these moments. Convince us of our primary identity in life. May we plant our feet in who you are and what you've done. May we let the words you have spoken over us be the ones that bring our significance and our meaning. Help us to live for your well done and not settle for the lesser rewards we're tempted to chase after. Jesus, I pray for those this morning who have not made that decision yet to surrender their lives and to follow you, to receive their identity as your sons and your daughters. This morning, may they experience the transforming power of your forgiveness. As they repent of their sins, may your spirit bring new life to them. Lord, for each one of us, may your spirit come and make the truths of 1 John our reality. That a child of God would not be a term we read, but it would be who we are. It would transform every aspect of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. We stand with me? The band's going to lead us in a, a couple songs as we finish this morning, reminding us of our identity, the safety, the security that it brings. If you'd like someone to join with you uh, in prayers, either to begin in that new life as a child of God, or, or maybe you're just facing some other challenges and struggles, if you'll head out the back doors and to your left, Pastor Rennie and some of our prayer team will be waiting to meet you in the prayer room to join you in those prayers, that the, the truth of Scripture will become the truth of your life. The rest of us, let's sing these songs as a declaration of what Christ has won for us. Thanks for watching this message. You can view more messages and watch live online on Sundays at ChristianChapel.com. Have a great week.